Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of the Cheeky Natives. This is your boy Le Tlokhonola in all things literature and obviously I'm flanked by two of the most beautiful people tonight. So, uh, I mean, and it's really interesting because yesterday was just Women's Day, so to have this event is also like a commemoration of stories told by black women. Um, Alma? So on today's podcast, we have the very, very special and very talented Panache Chigumadzi, um, who doesn't really need too much introduction from the Cheeky Natives. I think you guys know that we're big fans of Panache's work. But Panache has written her second book, which is amazing. And um, the book is titled These Bones Will Rise Again. And we'll get into the title and why Panache wrote this book. But uh, we just want to welcome you, Panache, to the Cheeky Natives. It's been long awaited. Thank you for coming to join us. No, thank you for um, having me. And as I was saying, um, today, I think the work that you're doing is really amazing, really important. Um, particularly, it's often thankless work that you will do um, in creating um, a literary culture. Um, I think right now is a really exciting time to be um, a person in literature. I think there's a lot of writing happening, there's a lot of publishing happening, there's a lot of podcasting happening, there's a lot of conversations, festivaling, um, selling. So I think it's a really exciting place and time, particularly right now, for um, young black writers um, to be in this space right now. And just people interested in literature, I think it's a really great space to, to be in. So thank you for being part of creating that culture. No, I mean, we do this because it's our passion. Mm. We saw that there was a gap in the market. Mm. There just isn't critical conversations about books happening enough. Mm. So we hope that platforms like the Cheeky Natives will start creating you know, critical engagement with, about and literature. And they are. You're really doing that. So <laughs> congratulations to you. Thank you. So before we start, we obviously want to ask you to read so that everyone can have a taste of like the actually really important and necessary work that you've written. We want to know, you know, in the last few days, you've been really busy, you know, launching from Zimbabwe to Polokwane and also in Joburg and Pretoria. How have those launches been for you, like the experiences of journeying through going from Harare coming this way? How, have, how has that been for you? So I think uh, this is the Southern Africa leg of, of, of the book. So this is the Southern African edition that I'm, I'm launching. But the first um, launches that I did do were in the UK. And just also for, you know, I can get flack for that or just speak to just some of the um, dynamics around the fact that, well, the people who commissioned me to write this book mm. was Indigo Press, which is... Um, directed by Eloa Katama Alfri. She's the publishing director, um, and she has been the one who, who asked me to, to write this book. So had it not been for Ella, we probably would not be sitting here with these bones to rise again. So the first um, launches that I did were in the UK, which is really um, great. And each, each uh, space that I go to, each host that I sit with, um, offers a different kind of conversation. Each audience I sit with um, offers a different kind of conversation. Um, and I think the first one that I did in Southern Africa was Harare, um, which was really something I really fought hard to do. Um, and I say this because it's not an easy publishing market. Um, I think particularly publishing industry, I think over the last um, two decades, uh, the publishing industry in Zimbabwe has really been dealt a, a, a huge blow by the economics of the situation. So it, it very often people get very upset that, you know, why aren't your books in at, at home when you're writing about this country, but why aren't you doing this? But there's a lo often a lot of barriers. I know good friends of mine who will uh, send things to publishers who either just won't reply or they're um, worried about censorship issues or they're worried about costing. A whole range of things make it difficult. So I think um, the Harari one was really special to me. Um, particularly because I got to have a lot of my family there. Um, my grandmother, my surviving grandmother was there. And um, even before I got to speak, she spoke, which was really important. Um, and so it was, uh, did my great uncle, um, who is in the, in the book as well. So it was really important to have them there and get to see, you know, why it was that I was bothering them over the holidays. Um, and get, <laughs> for them to be part of the process was really um, important for me. Um, and I also did something in Bulawayo, which was also difficult because that was the day that um, <clears throat> many of the opposition protesters had gone into the streets of Harare and, um, you know, the end of it was bloodshed. It was, you know, six unarmed civilians being killed, some of them being shot in the back. So that was a very different kind of conversation. We just decided to show up because we'd let people know and there was no way of telling people that she can or can't come. Um, and so we decided that, you know, whatever the audience wants to do, they can do it. Um, so do you guys want to talk about 
about the situation? Do you guys want to talk mm. about the book? Um, and we ended up using the book as an entry point to really reflect on this particular moment, understanding, you know, and this is really what the book is about, to use understanding a very short period of time through a sort of panoramic view of history, mm. understanding how it is that we get to this point. Um, the next launch I had was in... Um, Bulukwani, which was really great. That's the city that I grew up, that grew up in, <coughs> one of the cities that grew me up. Um, and my mom was my moderator. So that was really <laughs> great because she, you know, one of the things she mentioned was that they're now afraid to speak in front of me um, at home because I do draw a lot of my family experiences. <laughs> so whatever little throwaway comment you might make might potentially end up in the book. So they're always not really sure about, you know, should I say this in front of her or, you know, they're, they're a bit walking on, on eggshells but even be, be, uh, beyond that was um, my I studied accounting um, because that's what good people are supposed to do good you know my, my, my father was, is a doctor my mom's an accountant so the idea was that you should you know probably study a profession and it was interesting because uh, the moderator asked my dad to, to, to come up and he did and the first thing he did he said not the, another MC not my mom somebody else asked him to come up and, and he said um, what I'd like to tell all the parents in the room and we had this at the church that I grew up in so we're in the church hall and he says that that um, one thing my daughter taught me is that parents should let their children study what they want to study. Um, and that was a really special moment because, you know, for a lot of this time you're doing this work, but you're not really sure how your parents really feel about this thing that you're doing. That's not really the thing that you should have done. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's been a many different conversations that brought up different kinds of things. So I genuinely am interested. You asked me, you know, what would you like to do with this conversation? I was like, whatever you want to do, let's do it. Um, because it does enrich me as well as an author to find out what the, what the audience um, thinks about certain things or what, what kind of interpretations or what kind of resonances different audiences will have. For example, I'm in uh, the UK, the black British audience might, might really connect to themes of dislocation, lost memories, you know, the memories that are lost across the sea, all of those kinds of things. So I'm really interested in what the audience is, um, finds that, that, that resonates uh, for them. So I'm really excited to have this audience here. Please don't be quiet. Uh, that's the one thing I don't like about being in the UK. It's a very quiet culture. So for me, I'm, you know, I'm black. I like people to make noise and, you know, hear, you know, what, what, you know, how do people feel? Don't they feel? So yeah, um, let's, let's try have this a lively discussion if we, if we can. I think now before we get into the book, we'll ask you to read uh, from your book mm -hmm. and get people a taste of what to get, what's in store for them. Uh -huh. So you asked me to read a particular section and yes. may maybe after this you can tell us why. So yes. I'm now telling, I'm putting you on the spot. Um, <laughs> you can tell us why you wanted this, this, this particular mm. section. So I'll start. So um, as if we're in church, you are going to go to page 148 of your, uh, <laughs> of your yellow pew bible um, <laughs> yeah. can i can i do something you let's, can can i do something can you i can. just start a little bit yes. further back okay yes. so actually let's start with uh, page uh, this is going to be a bit of a long one so let's start at at um page 146 you know, initially okay? I was That's going to do wanted. that, but right. I didn't know if you wanted to read that long. But you know what? It's okay. Flourish. We can. We can. <laughs> you you add one for okay. six, and you're just like, mm, we're pushing it. <laughs> well, you know, I just thought, you know, just to give a little bit more context. context. Yes, yeah, yes, I think yes, it's yes, a good yes. way yeah. to, to get us in. Okay. Um, I've never read this before, so out loud. So let's try this together. Should narrate. Pardon? Should narrate. <laughs> I should narrate mm -hmm. as I'm going along. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, well, let's start at page 146 and see where we, where we land up um, with that. If Zimbabwean politics is a game of time and space and its manipulations, different powers find the moments most suitable to their agendas, freeze them, and insist on them to the exclusion of all other time. History in our political game is no longer a series of recurring waves carrying us all within them as our ancestors intended, but a straightforward line of progress for the few. With Zimbabwe experiencing as much political turbulence as it has in a generation or two, we find ourselves swept up by waves of massive historical transformations that ripple across time and space. For black women in particular, 
to consider the vastness of the waves of knowledge of our mothers, their worlds, their words, their dreams, their songs that have been lost to us through the innocuous, innocuous fallibility of memory and the tongue, the violence of the colonial and the post-colonial almost seems unimaginable and impossible to grasp. The temptation then to concede these histories to those who are more powerful than us and have the ability to divine us through it becomes too great. And yet, if we still ourselves in the tumult to feel and consider the ways in which these historical waves have moved through our bodies and those who have gone before, we will discover that much has survived, passed down from breast to mouth, mouth to ear, ear to heart. Sometimes the vastness of what has been lost and distorted to us is there to be found by the most personal elements of history. At a time when the official portraiture of the nation's new father, Emerson Nangagwa, has been installed so that we may look up at him in our offices, hospitals, schools, airports, post offices and stores, the act of imagining the last portrait of Mbuya Lilian Chigumadzi has provided me with stable ground on which to reimagine her, to reimagine re myself, to reimagine others, to reimagine the nation. After years of staring up at the looming portrait of Mugabe, waiting for our lives to change when the old man goes, a moment we came to think of could only we came to think could only be considered uh, con occasioned by death. The moment has come and gone, and we find ourselves where we where we found and we find ourselves where we first began the wait. The wait for his departure weighed down so heavily on our hearts and minds that it constrained the spirit of radical political imagination that has allowed us to make and remake ourselves time and again over the centuries. In the same ways we limited our political imagination to the end of colonialism with dire consequences for our post-independence years, Mugabe's end represented the end of our political imagination. Now that we are living through Mugabe's end, we will come to understand that Zimbabwe's future is not a matter of the old dying and the new being born. To reimagine Wea Lillian's lost portrait is to begin to conjure up the gallery of portraits of African women erased from history through forced land removals, migrant labor, rape by boss and fellow comrades, the exclusion from post-independence land ownership, domestic violence, the treacherous roads of cross-border trading, HIV AIDS. To imagine these portraits of women erased from the annals of official history is to confront our compulsion to erase and mitigate the image in the story of our making. To reimagine the portraits of women such as Mbuya Nehanda who have been enlarged and frozen is to confront our compulsion to reframe and distort the image in the story of our making. To imagine these women, both named and unnamed, is to face the historical present of both the physiological and psychological manifestation of cumulative and intergenerational traumas and triumphs that have brought our nation here. To imagine these women is to face their questions. They are difficult, they are painful, they are necessary. We cannot turn away, even as we know in our hearts that we collectively fear facing these women because they will demand that their questions be answered. We know that their questions will, will release a torrent of granite boulders that will destroy the versions of us and the nation that we hold dear, even as they harm us in ways untold. The force of their questions will surely crush the, crush the old certainties cast in Zimbabwe's great house of stone. And then, what will become of us? Who will we be? <laughs> I think we, we just need a moment from that. Um, Does everyone feel like they've just been taken to church? <laughs> um, you asked us why we wanted you to read that particular passage. And I think it's because Letokhanol and I often have conversations about what it means to reimagine yourself. You know, and it's, it's a personal question to ask because, yes, we have ideas that, you know, we need this and this. And often we ask people, so when the revolution comes, what next? And what after that, you know, and it's it's just an important question to ask that reimagining. What does reimagining look like? What does this reimagined future look like? And um, I think you also touched on some very interesting points that we want to go into in the book. But I mean, when you speak about erasure, that's that's something very painful that's happened to a lot of black women that you get written out of history you know you get written out of movements that you start and that you spearhead right you'll never get the credit for that because 
Richie often doesn't look like the face of a black woman over and over again. And uh, that's basically why we wanted you to read that mm-hmm. passage. Yeah, and I think also just to, you know, I think these poems will rise again really does a work of starting to archive and excavate mm-hmm. the lives of black women. So I think that particular chapter also, or the particular reading or where the chapter starts, it also speaks about what that looks like because you speak about like reimagining the women that have been erased already. Mm-hmm. So what does that look like excavating their lives? Mm-hmm. But also how are we going to ensure that the women are written into history going to the future? So I suppose the first question to ask is, these bones will rise again. Like, I mean, I have both read the book, so we now know where these bones will rise again yeah. comes from. But I mean, for people and for listeners on our podcast, what is the significance of the title of the book? Mm-hmm. So this book comes, as I mentioned, it was a commission. Ella Wakatama Alfrey, um, she gave me a call a few weeks or so after the coup, not a coup happened. Um, and she said, I'd be interested in your response to this moment um, as a so-called born free. Um, and I had met Ella about a year or so before that um, at Africa Rights Festival um, in the UK. Um, and at the time, I was, I think, in the middle of doing my research, my master's research, which is on the figure of Mwia Nehanda. And... Um, versions of Zimbabwe's history. So how is she deployed in the ways in which uh, history is told in Zimbabwe and has been told and continues to be told? Um, and particularly because um, Buya Nehanda is quite possibly the most famous person in Zimbabwe's liberation history. So as an anti-colonial heroine, um, and the one that people do refer to, and I'll explain what I mean by the one specifically, um, is um, a spirit medium who existed um, in the 1890s. Well, she, of course, she lived longer than that, but the specific moment is um, part of her leadership um, amongst many others who led this resistance against the British South Africa Company at the time, so the encroachment of the settlers at that time um, in what is known as the first Chumurenga um, of 1896 to 1897, and she's then executed um, in April of um, 1898. Um, and so her famous dying words are, my bones will rise again, um, right, meaning which is speaking to a kind of spirit that's going to come back and continue that moves beyond uh, a particular moment. And and throughout this a metaphor that we use is frozen and a frozen image. And I think mm-hmm. um, outside of uh, Mugabe's portrait, I would think that one of the most recognizable images in Zimbabwe mm-hmm. is the image of Mbuya Nehanda. If you Google her, you'll see a particular image of her um, standing next to another spirit medium, Sekuru Kagubi, and this was um, just before they were about to be executed. Mm-hmm. Um, and so her words have served as inspiration for uh, Zimbabwe's second Chimurenga, which is the liberation war of the 70s. Um, and this became this interrogation of liberation and Chimurenga was important because in the moment that the coup not a coup happened, the writing of history in that moment, because Zanu PF, as many other I think parties and and liberation movements and any power that be that that is, um, is always deliberate about how they deploy and narrativize a particular moment. So um, the, it was code named Operation Restore Legacy, um, and you know in in, in square brackets we can say uh, the legacy of the liberation struggle so or legacy we can then extrapolate that and say legacy of the Chimurenga so my question was then what is Chimurenga what has it meant according to the state um, so almost the capital C version of Chimurenga that we've spoken <laughs> about I mentioned elsewhere um, and then I would I was interested in if this is what the state is saying if this is what Zanu PF is saying I'm interested in what is Chimurenga to me? What is the small C Chimurenga that has belonged to my grandmother, that has belonged to me, belonged to my mother, that will belong to my daughters and granddaughters um, as an intergenerational kind of um, mode of African self-liberation outside of the very gun-centric, fellow-centric mm-hmm. idea of capital C <laughs> Chimurenga is what I was interested in understanding. Um, and I think a few weeks before um, the coup not a coup happened, my grandmother, my, my paternal grandmother, Mbuya Lilian Chigumadze had just passed away. Um, and uh, I was 
I, I couldn't go to her funeral and there was just a whole lot of things that a, a deep sense of loss that I had about her passing and it was you know particularly because I felt that I'd never really gotten to know her and know her outside of my grandmother but who is this person um as a person so you know um outside of being my father's mother outside of being my grandfather's wife outside of being you know somebody something i wanted to know who was she um what did she mean to herself what were her dreams what were her aspirations those were never really the kind of conversations i ever got to have with her and I, I almost I always told myself that I will eventually and I put all kinds of barriers around that of course also growing up in South Africa not being there to just also just get to be with her meant that a lot of these conversations didn't happen um, I mean I resonated very deeply with that because I also lost my mom last year when I was mm -hmm. in the US and um, so for me that a similar process happened you know you you always think you're going to ask the people in your mm -hmm. life the questions that you've always wanted to mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then they die mm -hmm, you know and then you're mm -hmm. like oh crap mm -hmm. i should have actually asked them oh hey what was your favorite color mm -hmm. or your favorite song mm -hmm. so i enjoyed that through the journey of speaking about your grandmother and speaking about mbuya nahande we also get to see you journeying and finding out your own history mm -hmm. so the book is not only about the response to zimbabwe but it's also for me a journey of trying to figure out who panache is and who was uh, mbuya Chukumadzi, a black woman before she became your grandmother. So I really like, I enjoyed that a lot. I also think it was, um, there's, a, there's a section in the book where you, you say, where somebody says, you know, some things are not spoken about. And I found that to be such a, such a powerful statement because we often have things that we don't speak about in our own families. But I think our idea of speaking about things also sometimes is very exclusionary. And I think even though there are things that we don't speak about, you manage to to get a good sense of, of the history that you'd wanted to excavate. And and I thought that was just such a powerful, powerful turning point in the book, right? Because you you'll see when you read this book, we don't want to do it. <laughs> but there's a journey that she undertakes. And I and, and I was having this conversation with the talk on all about we often think about big conversations. We think that you need to have these big conversations where you sit and somebody tells you how in the winter of nineteen eighty they did this and this and this and sometimes the the, the truth or the, the the heart of the matter is in the smaller conversations you know the things that we often don't speak about um there's a very interesting part in the book where you speak about language i think mm -hmm. a large part of of the book also covers your sort of feeling like you've, you've covered feeling distant from or feeling like a sense of remoteness from from home because you've grown up in South Africa and you've spent a large part of your life here, you're on the diaspora and you speak about language and, and how you and your brother forgot, at some point you forgot Shona. Why did you think that was an important thing to include in the book? Um, well, just the epigraph or one of the epigraphs of the book is history is created in the mouth. Mm. Um, and that is a quote from Yvonne Vera, the late Yvonne Vera, mm. um, who's a brilliant um, Zimbabwean novelist. I always want to call her a poet um, <laughs> because her work is poetry. When you read it, it's so lyrical and it's, it really forces you to learn to read differently. Um, and I think that was also an important metaphor as well, just going back to what you're saying. My, it was my grandmother, Mbuya Chiganzi, uh, my maternal grandmother, who says, meaning some things are just not asked about. Um, as I'm trying to ask her particular kinds of questions, it was just like, well, hey, you know, relax about a particular <laughs> thing. Or when I asked her about, you know, certain things about her mother, she's also saying that, you know, I, how could I have asked my mother mm. such a thing? And it's a similar kind of thing where with my parents, there's certain things I ask them about their parents. It's just like, hey, there's no way I could have spoken to my mom about mm. that particular thing. And where do I stand asking her <laughs> that particular kind of question? So part of the book was learning to hear the silence um, understand and just learn to read differently, which is why I love, really love Yvonne Vera's work because very often I think the Western response to her book has been that it's so dense, it's so opaque. I remember reading one review and I was so shocked and they said, um, somewhere in there is a novel. Um, you know, and that was really instructive to me because there's this way in which if, if things are not immediately apparent to you, you then decide to disregard it. And you know, learning how do I listen differently, um, which is why I say even reading Yvonne Vera, you're forced to learn to read differently and you can't read that book once, you have to read it many times over and I think similarly to some of these conversations, um, I also had to learn 
a lot, new ways of doing a lot of things and it's not just hi i'd like to know about xyz you know you don't you can't have that kind of very colonial idea of being an anthropologist and you're going to have all your questions and you're going to have a um a, a board where you sit and you tick off the questions as you go along sometimes many of the things that were revealed to me were things that were just because i was there um because i was spending time and someone would relay an experience not because i prompted it but just because we're here we're together i now have a sense of trust with you or you know it's it's a very different kind of relationship to uh, finding out history then these are my questions and i want you to tell me xyz some things you know came up in just allowing myself to just be um with people and i think throughout many of the different conversations i have throughout the book we had different kinds of responses from people who say well i can't tell you that um <laughs> you know again listening to these silences also understanding why people go behind these silences and as well as understanding coded silences that come from not understanding the language that people are speaking so for me um growing up in South Africa I moved to South Africa when I was about 3 years old so I've been in South Africa for as long as I've been it's been a democracy really um and I remember just really the, when I went to school I only could speak Shona then you get to school and all of a sudden you know these are the spaces where they're telling you you need speech therapy my brother also had to go to speech therapy mm -hmm. you know to make sure we get this thing out of your mouth mm -hmm. right um and so that is part of then the the sense of amnesia and, and it was actually an experience when we went to Tumbiza which is sort of the Soweto of jo of of Harare so the largest township in in Zimbabwe and had some of my cousins there and I was playing with them and it was just this I was so unselfconscious at that time and I'm playing with them speaking in English and all these kids go guys they're like you know um speaking in Shona and I was just speaking in English <laughs> and these kids is I had no self awareness about the fact that this is strange so I'm just going on about like guys we need to do one two three oh you guys got over there you know and whatever it was that happened uh, I think I was like maybe grade one or whatever grade two or some age that I was at and then all these kids started laughing at me and started saying oh mrungu mrungu which is you know umlungu whatever that kind of thing so that was you know my first rate awakening where oh this is actually a problem you know <laughs> so yeah, that was when i then had to be deliberate in in having to wake up to some of these these things and and part of when i how i regained the language as my grandfather was uh, my maternal grandfather was a teacher so we, i learned through books and reading showing the school readers and that kind of thing but the accent never quite was the right one <laughs> so i can read it um i can write it but the accent was never there because i've been here um but in the book throughout it um it is a search for history and stories mm -hmm. in different mm -hmm. kinds of places it's a very long bibliography at the back of the book and this is just the selected bibliography so there's a lot of very academic scholarship and this history from the traditional places but um a large part of this book was song for example was a very important place to understand and look for for history to look for stories that aren't often told um you know when i'm finding out about my grandmother and trying to say i'm speaking to her um her surviving brother well from the same mother and i'm trying to understand you know where did you come from so who was you, who were your great grandparents and you know he doesn't remember because he was too young to really have heard some of these stories and the thing that he does so, so i said okay well how else can i find this out so i have to think okay what is your mutubo what as in what is your totem mm. and then he says dliwayo and that is strange for me because in shona there's no l yeah. right technically there's no there's no l so you often hear you know um you say you say umlungu we say murungu you know a lot of things in in zulu are almost the same yeah. as just you just put the the r there and you say coca cola or so regasi whatever that kind of <laughs> thing cuz you know we have r is we don't have the L is not generally in that and so i'm confused like you know what do you mean and you can see okay yeah the, there's a reason why you would be confused as a shona person as to why there's a kiwayo and then he can explain he says jwangenda but meaning he's speaking to a particular nguni ancestor and he's speaking to a the movement that is happening in the 19th century of uh, many of the nguni clan so some of the more famous ones are you know mzilikazi and the kumalo clan who move up and they become the formation of the um, debele clan um, the debele nation or the debele kingdom and they incorporate a whole range of people as they're moving up they also incorporate suji people they incorporate people who would now know as shona people and dao people as well have the similar kinds of history and through that listening so history is created in the mouth you get to see how 
that paying attention to language is very important in understanding who our people are, mm -hmm. um, a lot of the values that are imparted in that. Even I think part of the book, I, I speak to what does it mean when we speak about Hunu, which is personhood in Shona, when someone speaks, being a person is not something that you take for granted. Mm -hmm. So in Shona, sometimes, and you'll see this in a lot of the Bantu languages, you know, within Southern Africa, when your mother is shouting at you or your father, whoever adult will say, Itamunu, you know, be a person, right? <laughs> what does that mean <laughs> to say, <laughs> you know, be a person? And I think you can find many other mm -hmm. translations for that, similar kinds of things. But in the same way, that, so, I, you know, you're always working towards personhood, right? Mm -hmm. you, can, you can jeopardize your, your personhood in the actions and how you act in relation to other people. If you don't affirm other people's humanity, you are not a person. Mm -hmm. Um, and you can think of that as a structural level where, you know, if you ask someone, um, you know, the question of if I want to find out someone's race, one way to do that is say, Munuere, is that a person? You can say, no, Murungu, right? No. <laughs> and you can see that. It's not a person. Of, and you can speak to that, right? That is, that is part of the language. And again, you would miss that. So if we think about now when people, we have many white scholars who have who can, particularly in the post-94 period in South Africa, people can talk about uh, Ubuntu, but we have an Ubuntu without Abandu, right? Yeah. Um, one that does not actually focus on the humanity of actual black people and it's more about a particular kind of project um, of saving whiteness in the onslaught of, you know, this revenge of, of, of black people. But had many of those scholars of Ubuntu, you know that um, a huge critique is that many of these scholars of African philosophy cannot actually speak African languages. How do you go through, I mean, imagine me, you know, doing French languages or French philosophy without having understood French. Mm. Um, you know, people will say, oh, you haven't read for non until you've read it in French, you know, that kind of thing. But nobody will have that kind of reverence for African language as a store of philosophy, as a store of value um, and values of a people. So that's why it was also important for me and perhaps maybe why intuitively I thought I'll have that conversation with my grandmother once I've really learned Shona. Once I, and I thought I'd, I'd go, um, I, and I'm going to do that now, but I, my, my aim was always to go and learn Shona at university. So I really wanted to have a very literary, scholarly understanding of, of Shona, almost as good as Mugabe Shona. Um, he's a very, he's, he's, his English is very good and his Shona is very, uh, it's a very deep kind of, of, of Shona. And if you listen to Alvam Tuguzi, he's also got a very deep kind of Shona. And that's the Shona that I wanted to approach my grandmother with and of course then you know she was taken away um, before that so I was kind of forced into finding myself through this and I had many people help me through the journey um, but that's why language is a very important part of the story in the history of us and understanding and the storying of ourselves is paying attention to um, our language and what it has meant um, over time and the last example I'll give is also the fact that with, through this book, I'm interested in stories outside of where we usually look at it. Mm. If we think about, I find that when I'm in Harare or in Zimbabwe, a lot of the language that people speak now is very rough. So people speak, you know, it's very quick for a child to say, ah, fuzeke, type thing. You know, a child will say, benzi, which is not a nice word. If people just very quickly jump to very vulgar, kind of impatient kind of language. And I think it speaks to a way in which there's a frustration with a particular kind of moment. Um, you know, it's the kind of petty evolve, so the, the release of the petty frustration uh, away from uh, uh, sort of because of the inability to do something about the broader structural issues, we, we, we sort of mm. release that in our everyday interaction. So people are very quick to jump to very vulgar language and insulting, say, Urimbwa, meaning you're a dog, you know, that kind of language seems to be a lot more um, prevalent right now, and even how people drive, which is something that I write in the book. But again, paying attention to these things can tell you a lot about a people, which is what I was interested in. I was not interested in a story about the politicians or the big men of our history. Mm -hmm. I was interested in a story about people. I mean, coming to the big men, right? So we, we, we know that the big men are, particularly in understanding African history, so we always talk about Thomas Sankara, we talk about Kwame Nkuru, we even talk about, in the context of Zimbabwe, Robin Mugabe, right? There's a certain benevolence that we have towards him, mm -hmm. but we don't talk about the women. And particularly the way in which you speak about Uncle Bob's wife, right? So you speak about Grace. <laughs> and um, I think it's an interesting conversation that you have in the book about like how benevolent we are to men and particularly the big men. Mm. But we, 
if we don't erase the women from history, we sort of misname them, mm. and we 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 really are we're very mean and vile towards and distasteful actually towards women. So I wanted to know what was the importance of you including Grace in the telling mm. of the coup, not coup. Mm -hmm. mm. yeah. Um, yeah, well, I think because central to the military's narrative of the moment is that we are removing criminal elements from the person of the president, and this is why we have to embark on this moment. So everything was swept into a Grace Mugabe-sized hole, right? Everything, you know, the, the narrative was, we're going to preserve the legacy of Mugabe, and you can see how he's been treated generally, um, even as he's kind of been a very petulant grandfather afterwards, <laughs> telling us that his, his roof is falling or whatever, and that kind of thing. But generally, he's been treated with, mm. with kid gloves and there's a way in which his legacy and the sense of respect and reverence for him even within the party has continued and it's it's really been framed that really um, and, and this is the narrative even when I'm speaking to people in their homes is yeah well you know he was bad but really the person who was terrible was, was Grace mm. you know the person who was and you know really in comparison I mean there are some, some cases but the person who's got blood on his hands is Mugabe mm. the person who has who's been there for I think what since the 50s since the late 50s has been Mugabe I mean Grace this is not to take away what she, uh, her, her role within politics but if we're speaking about the culpability for this particular political mm. moment um, it was very expedient to then be able to to blame Grace and really Grace's uh, real fault was that she was jeopardizing the succession planning within Zanu PF. It was not about you know what it meant for the rest of the country. It was really messing up with you know whether Mnangagwa can be that can be next or whether Sekamarai can be next. That was the issue. You know her stepping into this arena of fathers and sons and you know playing out of her role, um, particularly because I mean when you hear the way in which Mnangagwa has gone about telling the story is that you know Mugabe is a father to me. He continues to to emphasize that so he, this is this 94 year old father <laughs> to a 75 year old man and he's held my hand and he's done all of these things even when Mugabe has insulted Nangabe and if you notice again sp paying attention to language and everyday speech you'll hear that um, even you know in that in that press conference Mugabe will call everybody you'll say my kupe my mujuru so he's giving a particular kind of respect even to people who was dismissing but he'll say Emerson if you notice that he will say, Emerson, my mujuru, my so-and-so, whoever, he will give people particular kinds of respect, or baba so-and-so, whatever, but it's Emerson. You know, even, you know, he was saying, you know, he was, he said, um, Emerson, you know, is a good worker. Um, you know, that's also a particular language. What do you mean that he's a worker, i.e. someone who's not really trusted to think or do anything that is, you know, he's a good worker, but he's dishonest. You know what? That was a very disrespectful thing that he said. And yet still, there's a way in which even um, I saw an interview with, um, with, I think, Sky News and Emerson still was, you know, I'm very hurt by this, but he still refrained from, whereas Grace was clinically ill, she was a whore. And this is not just the political party. This was a Across the board, when people mm -hmm. were on the streets singing, we don't want to be ruled by a whore. So the, this is, again, even within the book, going through the history, coming through just um, the kind of dis-ease we've had historically about women, mm -hmm. women in public space. Um, and this is particularly from the, the colonial period and the, as the, 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 the colony is urbanizing, we have this fear of women um, that is encapsulated within the word of, of, of prostitute. Mm -hmm. So whenever women are not doing what they're supposed to be doing, they're going according, against our will, she's a prostitute, she's a whore. Um, so you can see this moment in 1956 where um, women at Carter Hostel um, then were raped because they did not follow through with the bus boycott that was called by the City Youth League at that time. And within that, then the excuse given was that these women who were actually mostly domestic workers, secretaries, um, were then called prostitutes because this is how you can afford the high bus fare. Mm. So the, the, word, the fact that this word continues, um, even the British, I mean, or rather the, the, the settlers, what they would call women competent, what they, they'd say that these are the prostitutes of the male soldiers, right? So there's this, always this framing of women mm. in public space, women doing what they're not supposed to be doing as, as prostitutes. And then you find that either women generally, you can become a Mbuya Nehanda who is a mother of the nation, who is all that is good 
within the nation or you are an evil stepmother <laughs> of the nation. And the best way to think about it is through Mugabe's two wives, which is Grace Mugabe and, and Sally Mugabe, who both are very complex figures. And you can see this even in South Africa, Winnie Mandela is not allowed her complexity. Nelson Mandela, of course, is allowed to be a complex figure, but you know, dare Winnie have any sense of, you know, um, complexity, she must immediately be disposed. And we're happy for her to carry the liberation struggle, for her to continue the name of the ANC. Um, but now that uh, liberation has come, you know, she needs to go back and become the wife again. So this is really, this was just important to just think broadly about how women are narrativized, even when they are afforded a place in history, just to be aware of the ways in which they are often dehumanized. I think an important conversation that we had post reading the book was about the idea that women are expected to know their place and I think it's something mm -hmm. that you've touched on you know so I mean with Grace Grace had done a number of things prior to this but it was the idea that Grace had the audacity to step into a public arena and demand space and I think it's an important conversation to have as a continent how uncomfortable we are with black women particularly demanding space and I wonder, had that been anybody else who had been as vocal about wanting to step into into that space, if the the, the reactions would have been as vitriolic, you know, would people mm -hmm. have been so offended by this idea that here is a woman who's just unaware of her place? Mm -hmm. And it's 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 a it's a concept that you you explore quite intensively in the book, you know. So. Um, and how respectability is also just a weapon that's used against women quite often, you know. So when Joyce Sekuru is being accused of wearing a mini skirt, I mean, as a, as a reason as to why she cannot lead and why that ludicrous criticism would only ever apply to, to a woman, even, even in 2017, that we can use that as a, as a reason to not place women in positions of power speaks to, even as a continent, how we haven't moved forward and how we afford black women space and what we're comfortable with black women doing. And I think it's, it's also a question of language and I think it's something that you explored, you know. The certain language, Cognon and I speak about this all the time, how black women will be called loud, but men will be assertive, mm -hmm. you know. He's just, he's just sure, you know. <laughs> She's just a lot. She yeah. just, Grace was a lot, but Mugabe was just, he knew what he wanted. And how dare, and that's an important question you address, how dare you, as a black woman on this continent, go forth and demand the things that you think you deserve. Whether or not you rightly deserve yeah. them is a different question. <laughs> I mean, to, say, just to, to be fair, it was, yeah. it was to say that um, I'm not, I do not claim her as a feminist icon yeah. Yeah, or definitely. anything like that. That's no, not, no, 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 one, not. No one has claimed no one has claimed as, as, as a, a feminist, feminist icon. icon. <laughs> and in particular, I do speak to the fact that, you know, she claimed being Mwea Nehanda, for yes, example, and how yes. ludicrous that was to, to people that she could say that <laughs> I am the representation the of Mwea Nehanda. And then she, yeah. as, as she begins this, she's, that was the beginning of her sermon, <laughs> and then Behind her was Mnangagwa, and she began to insult him <laughs> and his and her wi the wife, wife, uh, his yeah. wife, in the mm -hmm. same vein. But it's just to speak to the ways in which there's a gendered way in which people respond to mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. um, that when we speak about Togozani Kupe, I mean, Grace, let's just going back to her, she used that same language against other women. She's the one who began mm -hmm. to speak about Grace Mujuru as the miniskirt mm -hmm. wearer, saying, I've got evidence of you and your husband, and you know, you're like video. this, and that kind of thing. Or she, you know, she used very vulgar mm -hmm. language throughout. So she was a very shocking person. That was, that was really um, part of her. her <laughs> um her her brashness um was to really shock and use language that you've never heard in in, in yeah. a woman or anyone that was yeah. not a woman that was just anyone speak <laughs> at, at that pulpit yeah, and if you think yeah. about um the difference in Mugabe's speech is, I mean, Shona generally is, a, is not a direct language. Mm -hmm. um, people don't say things, you know, directly. We will use metaphor on your couch things in very particular ways. But mm -hmm. she, you know, <laughs> would also make a lot of kind of innuendo, yeah, sexual innuendo, yeah, speak yeah. about the fact that many of you don't even know if your children are your children, <laughs> you know, that kind of yeah, thing. She was that yeah, kind of person. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but it's still, it's, so, and it's still to speak to the fact that she could be, have been as vulgar as she was, but she was not Mugabe yeah. at the end of the day. So mm -hmm. to say that everything can be lain at her doorstep mm -hmm. um, is completely false. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, and in for me, um, at, there's no point at this book where I ever speak and say, this is a feminist text, this is a feminist no. analysis. This was just to say, how do we to analyze and understand how do we speak of women when we like them and when we don't, mm -hmm. when women do bad things, when women do good things, mm -hmm. because both of those things are often weaponized against us. Mm -hmm. Even in speaking about Mbuya Nehanda, who is a spirit that, of course, I have great reverence for, I'm also aware, aware, aware of the 
ways in which her good story is used to um, erase the stories of others, used mm. to um, erase the stories of other women. Mm. For example, we it's a, it's a particular narrative about who is the real ancestor of mm. Zimbabwe, for example. We don't talk about Queen Lozike Lodlo, for example, the last king of the Ndebele, for example. We don't speak about a whole range of women because there's a, a lot of subsuming under the figure of Mbuya Nehanda. So I think even in, in both situations, again, women are always emptied out of their mm. complexity mm. so that we can we can instrumentalize them mm. against all other women or whoever mm. it is that, that, that needs to be fixed in a, in a particular mm. moment. And I like there's a, a part in the book where you talk about, you say, um, you know, political history has made wombs of women, mm. right, and emptied them of complexity and impregnated them with what is good or bad in our society. Mm. So I think that metaphor is quite powerful that, you know, we understand Buya Nahande in a frozen image. You speak mm. about this frozen image in the book, that this is how we understand her. But we, in your research, in finding out about the medians and the spirit, you found that there were a lot of, not necessarily contradictions, but there are a lot of complexities in the figure, you know, which negate the idea of a frozen image, that this is one monolithic understanding of a person. But I think also speaking about that, your book is also really spiritual. Like I found myself really intrigued and interested in like the spirituality of Zimbabwe. Why was it important for you to frame or use spirituality as a praxis uh, in order to to analyze the coup, not coup? Mm-hmm. Um, I think again, I was not interested. First of all, I I really get frustrated when people want to talk about. Mugabe's Zimbabwe, for example. I think many Zimbabweans just get really frustrated in the way in which the country has been narrativized, mm. particularly growing outside of, of Zimbabwe. Mm. I grew up at a time where Zimbabwe was a laughing stock. We couldn't think about Zimbabwe outside of hyperinflation. You can't think about Zimbabwe outside of Mugabe. You know, and I wanted to understand a Zimbabwe outside of that. I was really interested to say, well, you know, that's not my entire experience. Of course, it's understandable that people would want to understand this figure, but there's so much more to this moment and even more so there's a way in which we hide behind him um, particularly around a lot of failings so as I speak to you know this issue of uh, the patriarchy in Zimbabwe as politics just as a particular example that's something that long precedes Mugabe for example that's something that you know we see in the opposition we see this in in all kinds of other spaces as we see this in song for example we see this outside of you know those spaces that you'd ordinarily think of it so in the in again in this book I'm interested in when we're going to have in our vision of a new Zimbabwe we need to think a whole lot more about a broader political culture um, as opposed to simply thinking about this figure needing to be gone and everything is okay. I think right now in this political moment, we're seeing that mm, he's gone. Well, he's not at, at the, the helm of power. Um, <laughs> but many of the problems that we had before are still there, if not worse, um, in this particular moment. Um, so I thought for me, spirituality was, I guess, even through spirit, uh, sweet medicine, I've been thinking about questions of spirituality for a while. Um, questions of conquest is not just the conquest of land, it's also the conquest of spirit. Um, and it's a, it's a book that's interested in being. What does it mean to be an African person? And over time, how do we make and remake ourselves? And so for me, I was always really intrigued by the fact of, of you know, someone like Mbuya Nihanda, a spirit medium, um, a spiritual leader, as well as a tactician. She is a military tactician leading war. Um, and I was interested in questions of what spirituality and liberation, what does it mean to find liberation beyond the gun, um, beyond you know, the, 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 the patriarchy. Um, and so spirit possession in this book was also important as a critique of brawn freeness. Um, the idea that because you're born at an arbitrary point in time, I mean, it's not that arbitrary, but if really thinking about it, that an arbitrary point of time a marker in time means that you're free of everything that happened before that Mm -hmm. um is something that is very dishonest and on one hand i you know it is something that i can understand in the sense that you want these children to be free of the things that you had to go through you want them to have a better future and so you say that right you go to these schools you have these opportunities you are going to be a born free and this is something i've spoken about in the south Mm -hmm. african context as well um on the other hand it's also used to say that 
these questions of liberation, these questions of who gets to rule, mm-hmm. only belong to a particular generation of people. Mm-hmm. You young people, just keep on looking forward. Don't question us about this. We will continue leading until you know a particular point of time. Maybe once we're dead, uh, you know, um, Grace McGovern would say, even when he's in a real barrel or whatever, he will keep on leading. You know that kind of thing. Um, but and even within Zimbabwean mm-hmm. politics, there's there's a way in which. Um, this idea that when the old man goes, so once a particular generation of people is gone, mm-hmm. we'll be okay. Um, and then you think, you, again, if you look at Zimbabwean politics generally, there's a lot of things that are very much a ZANU kind of culture that are also evident in other political spaces. We can think of MDC and their mm-hmm. vanguard movement, which has become quite violent, and the many different aspects that continue to live even within young people mm. um, and aren't just going to go because a particular generation of people have have, have gone. Um, and the other way in which the opposition kind of responds to history is to say that we're just forward looking, we don't look at the past, mm. you know, at, and I think both positions are very regressive, that ZANU-PF owns history and the opposition owns the future. Mm. Um, and so with the spirit position, it is a uh, philosophy, it's a practice saying that those in the present are working in struggle with those in the past about the future to come. So you're always working with all states of, of time so that whatever you do when you are imagining a new nation, you're imagining one that one honors your ancestors but also is true to the aspirations of those in the present as well as something that you can actually uh, bequeath to those uh, in the future and I think that's really important to be able to do as opposed to thinking that it's only the history uh, or the past to the exclusion of the future or it's only the future to the exclusion of, of the past. So you spoke about Yvonne Vera earlier, mm-hmm. and uh, you list quite a few female black novelists that you said you came to find yourself in them. And and I think a lot of us can relate to first reading that book by a black author and, and feeling like you were represented in, in, in reading and in writing, that your lived experience was taken note of. So really my question is, why was that such a powerful moment for you that you read Titi Dangaremba and it did something to you and your and sort of feeling that your lived experience was recorded. And I think connected to that is, you know, we're a literary podcast. Of course we have to ask you who your favorite authors are, mm-hmm. or at least two or three books that have absolutely changed your life. Yeah, your literary influences. Um, I, I mean, I never have favorites generally because I think I'm just as a person who's always changing. I think mm-hmm. many of us will, can relate to that. So just certain things work for you at a particular point in time. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm also a person who likes to consume things until diminishing marginal returns. So a very economic <laughs> kind of turn. So I, until I can't have any more of this thing and then I can no, never stand it anymore. Um, but I think for me, someone who's really resonated a lot with this and that's why she's an epitaph and you'll see a whole range of just <laughs> references to her work is Yvonne Vera. Mm-hmm. I think she's um, really under-celebrated um, in the world, the broader world of, of, of literature and, it, and maybe because it's, it's, she's, she's not an easy person to read and I mean that in with, with the greatest sense of respect and adoration for what she forces you to have to do. Um, and I think particularly because she is someone at this moment when I'm interested in questions of what is history, what isn't history, um, the ways in which from you know her first novel, Nehanda, right up until um, The Stone Versions, the ways in which she deals with questions of history um, are not the ways that we are taught to understand history mm-hmm. um, and taught to read narrative and understand narrative um, and the way in which she deals with silences and those difficulties within our histories and the difficulties of um, speaking um, is something particularly because very often we say if we just give women a, a, if we just give women a voice everything will be fine you know and <laughs> that's not that's not the case right and I think that's really important she's forced me to learn to listen better um, as a reader Um, and particularly Nehanda is a really important book for me the question of spirituality it was an almost spiritual history of Nehanda because I was used to reading the sort of very um, the the, the very Cartesian so I'm using very you know thinking about Western epistemology there's a particular version of history so the Hegelian understanding that um, 
Africa does not have a history and history only comes into being once the Europeans have come and give you, you know, um, written texts and that's when history really begins in Africa. But prior to that, you have no history, you're ahistorical. And in this book, the way in which she centers a different understanding of what history can be and has meant and it's not linear, um, it is a almost circular understanding of history is something that was incredibly um important to me but I do name throughout the book you can go through the the, the bibliography yes. it is also that extensive. love letter it's an extensive bibliography mm. to speak to the fact that um we there are black women who've been writing and many different sources of knowledge for me have been there so people like Audre Lorde with mm. um um her book Zami a new spelling of my name the idea of the biomethography was incredibly important again in decolonizing ideas of what is history mm. um understanding that black womanhood is a fiction so all to storytelling or history is some form of myth making again mm. going back to Yvonne Vera history is created in the mouth so being able to imagine my grandmother even when she was not there being able to use the fragments of history um, as we go along was important people like Raida Jacobs mm. Yvette Christiansa the work that they have done in South Africa in writing slave narratives or narratives of, of the interior lives of enslaved people, um, particularly because in South Africa, unlike the US, for example, we don't have the written records or self-authored slave narratives. So then having to the work, do the work of rememory, the work of saying, you know, how do I find out or you know i can use the oral histories i can use food i can use prayer i can use song i can use different ways to rememory these women who are silenced by history those are the people who've been really instrumental for me in this particular moment people like maurice conde for example um from the caribbean her work has been really important for me as well um people like um jamaica kinkard edwish dantikard those are people um, i at i do whole range of people who've been incredibly important I think, again, I would just say the bibliography, but it's only a very, it really doesn't do justice to the people that, that have been really important to me locally, people like Kwezi and Bandazayo, which is why I spoke to her the day, just her work as well. So, yeah, I could do a whole, we can do a whole podcast <laughs> of just my people who've done really important things for me as, as a writer. Um, I think it's interesting that you... We often talk about how memory is quite fallible, and it's mm -hmm. something that you cover in the book. You know that memory is not infallible. It's 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 often quite subject to what was happening at the time, what you felt like, or what you hoped had happened instead of sometimes what really happened. But that being said, you still use it as quite an important practice for locating a lot of the women in the book. You know, and I'm curious <coughs> why you do something that's as fallible as memory in what is sometimes quite a not like is a, is a critical analysis of the of a moment in time. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm very curious as to why you did that. Mm -hmm. I suppose then the um, paying attention to what people hold on to, what people don't, um, is important because um, even in understanding these academic histories, it's understanding that that is also fallible. I mean, you know, if you go through academia, sometimes if you you know just start in academia, it's um, it can be quite a shock when you read a critique of someone. You like, oh my god, I thought this was the Bible, and this person just <laughs> really just um, knocked this whole thing down. Um, but you you kind of realize then you're constantly revising mm. throughout. There's never going to be a particular version. You know, if you think about the history that we were taught in school, it goes through particular kinds of um, revisions over time. And then recognizing that all histories ultimately um, have to go through or will go through these different kinds of, of revisions. There's, no, there's really no real sense of, of obje objectivity in the ways in which we've been taught. Um, so that was very important. And that's why the metaphor that I use within this book is that history is water. I don't see history as a forward march in progress, and I don't see history as necessarily something that is always objective. And the metaphor of, of water, and again going with the freezing of history to say that this is the authoritative account of a particular moment, the water is a way to understand that the history comes to us in a series of waves. At particular moments, different things will be washed up by those waves. Different things will be left on the sand. Um, and again, as well as you know, the metaphor of 
somebody walking across the water's edge, you sometimes take for granted how that water came to you. So if you are, you know, at, at a particular point in the river, you're not necessarily knowing how this water, where it came from, whether it's the top of the mountain, whatever, all of those things, how it gets to you in this moment. We often don't think about how did this history come to us in this particular mm-hmm. moment in time. We don't interrogate how history comes to us in the forms that it does. Um, and so history as water is about being open to history as something that is always moving and always changing. And the fact that we're always revising history really according to what works for us mm-hmm. in a particular moment. Mm-hmm. So as I'm going through the story of Mwea Nehanda, mm-hmm. for example, I'm speaking to many different people. And at some point I'm super frustrated because I'm like, oh my God, can the one person give me a single story about mm-hmm. this person? Um, but then you realize that that's a very Western idea, um, a very colonial idea that this is meant to be the the authoritative account Um, all of these things are true these are all you know they don't need to necessarily cancel each other out although to be honest sometimes you'd have people who are what also frustrated me was people saying that my account is the account (laughs) so and so doesn't know anything and I'm like well you know so that's a whole story for another day um, because people, through telling these stories, people are asserting their authority. So again, the trouble of history in the mouths of those who are authorities is something we should always be questioning. So for me, it was important to... Trusting the oral narrative was just the same way that I need to, I've learned to, I have to now distrust the written narratives as well. Just because it's been written in that way does not mean that that is the authoritative account very often you know just because some white man at a particular point wrote about your ancestors in a particular way very often we're like no that's not how it it happened maybe he didn't understand the language maybe that's just what the people that day decided to tell him so they could get off their back you know all of those kind of, and and really people are very and and as i go through some of these stories and speaking to different people people will decide to conceal and not and tell particular things just like with my grandmother she was clear that you know some things I can't tell you. Mm. Some things I'm just not going to do. So that was important in understanding that all of these forms of history ultimately mm. are, are fallible. So, you know, the, the placing of more value on some is, is not a neutral mm. kind of thing. It's, you know, the, the mouths that tell particular stories are the ones that, you know, we don't trust certain mouths to tell history. We <laughs> need it to come from, you know, a white historian, a white mm. anthropologist. Then we'll believe this account, but when it comes from the, you know, the people who live this history, we're kind of doubtful about, you know, whether this actually is true or not. And that was something that was important for me to allow myself to learn to revise, just like with my grandmother, in reimagining her. I always thought she was a rural person. I thought she grew up Kumusha, for example. Um, but then going through this history, I had to be open to the fact that, no, she was actually someone who grew up in town. She was a born Rukeshen, as you'd call it, in Zimbabwe. And that, again, was important, that being open to history as something that's always moving and not foreclosed was very important. And that extends beyond the oral. That also extends to these written accounts of, of ourselves. I mean, we've been having such a great conversation. I'm sure people are dying to ask you questions. So at this point, we're just going to, you know what we normally don't do in those cheeky natives, we end the podcast right here, but we're not going to do that (laughs) today. Um, So we're just going to go over to the audience and ask maybe two questions uh, and then continue the conversation and see how it goes. So if anyone has a question, please raise your hand. Not all of you at once. Here in front? (laughs) Yes. Thank you very much. Um, I had uh, one question concerning the, the books and the fact that um, like I just have a quick look at it with this yet. But you said that you quote a lot of um, lit- academic literature and also I saw you quote uh, interviews. And so um, your book, like, uh, my question was one of the questions was is there fiction inside? Do you introduce like fiction, fictional elements? inside the books or is it only like story from your families and from academic literature and the, in any case whatever the, the answer I think you you say you you're thinking about what is history what is not history and I think this kind of book is typically like also a historical uh, like thing because it's your point of view about a um, historical uh, moment and also, you are creating history or her story, and I think it's very, um, very, very important. And um, yeah, that's. Okay. We'll take the Thank second you. question. Uh, hi, Vanessa. Hello. I look forward to reading your book. Uh, my question is: uh, 
question is, um, and you correct me if I misheard you when you started reading, um, you said something about how history is a straight line or a straight it's like, not a straight line. Oh, you said it's not. Yes. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. That makes sense now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so, uh, okay. Remind, explain that more. What, what do you mean by that? I've got one question. Was it yes? Yes. Was your question? I've got a question. So, throughout the entire conversation, it's quoted very late. So there's a part where I'm interested in what you are writing about a point or a lineage that you were not exposed to. So therefore you were raised or you were in South Africa, right? And you had to do your research about something that you were not brought up in. So my question is, how did you compensate for that part? Without, without doing research. So, meaning the culture is, if you not brought and raised in Mabonim, right? You will not understand the culture of Mabonim. You were brought up in Cape Town, you had to ask people who were brought and raised in Mabonim. So how did you overcompensate for that gap? Mm -hmm. Anyone else have a burning question that that's asked? Okay. Uh, <laughs> so I just would like to avoid <laughs> droning at you. So can I do this right, right? This okay. group and then okay. do the next one? Yeah, cool. Okay. That's okay. Um, so let's start with uh, the academic part. I think um, one thing that in well, let me just start with sort of where I would locate myself intellectually or some of the things that have also influenced me is um, a large part of when I was doing the initial sort of very academic research, you know, for my master's, um, was a time when it was, you know, fees must fall, fallism, we're talking about decolonization. So that's a huge influence for me. Um, and there's a whole lot of things that we were questioning. We were questioning what is um, epistemology, what is Afri an African epistemology, how do we know what we know, all of those kinds of questions. Um, and particularly, then in questioning epistemology and ways of knowing, ways of being, I think was also questioning the Western kind of the Cartesian dichotomies of there is reason, unreason, there is thinking, there's feeling, there's body, there's spirit. Um, that was very important to do. And those dichotomies, you know, within the Western kind of, of uh, ways of knowing and being extend across. So it's always about people are always either man or woman, public, private, all kinds of separations are always made continuously as a way to control people. Um, and so interestingly enough for me, I think in writing this book in the form that is written, which is in some parts very much memoir, in some parts it's political analysis, in some parts it is the philosophy, um, but going to different places to look for the philosophy. So saying I can talk to different understandings of personhood by virtue of listening to a song and this is what a person says, or this is when my mother scolds me, this is what is being meant, was incredibly important to do. And going through uh, photography and the visual analysis was important as a way to decolonize our understandings of what is knowledge, where do we seek knowledge, because very often those are the ways in which we are disenfranchised of what, is, what we know, so that there's a particular authority and there's those who know history, those who don't, those who do and don't have history. Um, and so then that's why I go back to Audre Lorde's biomethography in understanding, that's why she didn't, she could have called her book a memoir or a biography, an autobiography, but she was deliberate in saying, this is a biomethography because all of the storytelling I'm doing is a kind of mythography I'm doing of myself. Um, and it's the mythography of the world. And just like the way in which histories that we tell of the nation are kinds of mythographies of, of, of the nation. Um, and so, um, in this, obviously a lot of this part of this book is that I use my ma imagination. So um, yes, it, so it's, for me it's not antithetical to say I'm going to go through some of these historical records about, you know, this is when this building was built, this is when X, Y, Z sort of happened, as a way to reimagine the life of my grandmother because she's gone. Um, and for me, the exercise was how do I recreate that photograph of hers that I create, uh, that, that I lost, 
in my mind through going to the places and visiting the places that um, she might have frequented, speaking to her family as a way that for me was a site of imagination as well in the same way that a political vision for a country is an, an act of imagination. Some people would describe all activist work ultimately is science fiction because you're imagining a world that doesn't exist. Um, so just thinking differently about what is imagination and what isn't imagination is sort of what freed me to draw um, from the, the part of me that does write fiction. All, all of these things really interconnect with each other. In fact, this book, the research that I was doing for this book was came out of my wanting to write a novel about Mbuya Nehanda, for example. But the places that really challenged me most intellectually about what is history were not the, the textbooks. The places that actually challenged me the most, like I mentioned, Yvonne Vera's book, Nehanda, and the way she wrote that history was something that did the most for me intellectually and understanding that. So for me, there's not really a demarcation of this is fiction, this is not. It's saying that these were all spaces, and even in the bibliography, you'll see that I cite fiction as well as part of that intellectual legacy so and as well as song all of these different spaces are things that inform something that people have tried to really say is this memoir is this i'm like oh, it's a book we, we can call it creative nonfiction. um that's 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 the term and it's it's to speak to the genre branding because as africans we've been or people have been colonized have been genre bending all this time. And that's why when, you know, colonialists come here, they're like, okay, what do we do with this? Okay, this is a that or whatever in order to control um, um, people. Um, the next question just around history is not a straight line of progress. Um, I think, again, going to fallism, something that was also quite influential for me was thinking about Afro-pessimism um, and, um, thinking through the claim or the, the assertion that really nothing has changed. Um, the world remains anti-black. We continue in these, you know, the master-slave dialectic. What does that actually mean? Um, but that was, that was important in questioning a kind of liberal, humanist kind of assumption that, you know, Martin Luther King often says that the moral arc of the universe will bend towards justice. justice. Mm -hmm. um, and to me, I kind of look at history and I'm like, mm, no, kind of doesn't really <laughs> bend towards <laughs> justice <laughs> if I think about the history of black people. So the moments of crisis for the West you know, if we look at, you know, for black people, we're like, no, the crisis was happening for us a long time ago. Um, you know, if we think about, for example, World War II, World War I, the world wars were these huge moments of crisis for Western mm -hmm. liberalism and Western sense of humanity. But then if you can't, you know, so i.e. thinking about um, the Holocaust, but then, I mean, a good friend of mine is doing research right now about the Holocaust in Namibia, for example. Mm -hmm. That genocide had happened, but at the same time that these huge strides in notions of history and enlightenment is happening slavery is happening um you know so what are you talking about when you're saying that now we've necessarily progressed in civilization to dehumanize people at the same time as you're claiming the highest form of humanity doesn't quite make sense to me so again the straight line of progress so we are colonizing you so that you may be civilized so that you can go forward with time is to speak to so i think for me as a colonized subject uh, pushing against this forward notion of history um, is very important. And also, again, in understanding, the, very often we would say, um, I can't believe this is happening right now. I can't believe we have a Trump in 2018. Um, you know, that again, it's this implicit assumption about this forward march in progress that by now certain things should not be happening um, because we should have made particular kinds of gains. Um, and so for me, um, it's not so much a cynical worldview, it's just rather to say that, again, that's why history as a mo series of moving waves becomes an important way for me to understand the world, to say that you can't take for granted that just because your mother fought for this and one particular thing that you're gonna, you, that, that battle is gone forever. Maybe it's something that recedes at a particular moment, but it's gonna be washed up again and you're going to fight it in different kinds of, of forms and that's why history as, as, as water as waves becomes more uh, useful to me um, as a black person so that I don't have this kind of despair that oh my god I can't believe that right now we have to fight one to three it's to say well you just have to take each moment for what it is you can't take for granted that just because something was fought then 
you know, you're not going to have to fight that. The particular things, even with our children, which is, I think, the most optimistic act is to have children. Um, you know, if you, if you, and thinking about that very seriously about, you know, why in a lot of slave societies, people would kill their children, would rather not have children because they don't have hope for the kind of world that their children are going to live it, live um, within. So if I'm saying, and I'm an Afro-pessimist, and I still want to have children, what am I saying about my view of the world. Um, so ultimately, really, for me, I just take each moment, each historical epoch as that moment. I'm not going to then, in the same way that people say, oh, because we thought Mugabe was gone, we should have pro progressed at a particular moment. No, you take this moment for what it is um, and not allow yourself to, to be lulled <coughs> into certain notions of progress and then be surprised every time, you know, you've got the neo Ku Klux Klan that's just, you know, come into mm -hmm. into being. So I think that's why history not as a straight line is something that's important for me to do as a colonized person. So I'm not always caught um, off guard. Mm -hmm. um, questions of a lineage that I'm not exposed to. That's interesting because you know, it's it goes to a whole lot of questions, just, you know, even with um, why, you know, for example, on this book, I'll say just I'm Zimbabwean born, for example, which is this, a way of me to sort of not saying, are you Zimbabwean, are you South African, what exactly are you? Because that's what people always want to know. Um, what exactly are you? Um, and I'm very clear that I claim both of those things because both of those experiences have shaped me. Um, and just because I've grown up in South Africa does not mean I'm not shaped by Zimbabwe. Um, maybe it's not the ways, and it certainly isn't the ways in which someone is shaped by virtue of growing up there. Um, but I think I can speak to many of the ways in which my childhood was very Zimbabwean, just whether it's the music we listened to, my parents remain, you know, my parents are not going to somehow, just because they came here, not be um, Zimbabwean. So i.e. Um, the music we listen to, the language we speak at home, and as much as I had that period of really being influenced by school, but my parents continued to speak to me in Shona, just that I could not speak back to them. Um, so that's why I could have the conversation with those kids, only that I'm speaking back <laughs> to them in um, English and not realizing that this is a problem. But anyway, so um, all of those things, the food that we eat, um, these things don't just disappear. And again, even just questioning born freeness is also a critique of time and space as well, that just because you aren't in a particular space does not mean that you're not with that space um, throughout you. So just if we think about, even as I'm speaking about issues around Chimurenga, how do I feel that as a pain of my own, even if I didn't live through the first or second Chimurenga, we can think about the fact that, um, for example, trauma is something, and there's research that people speak about, that trauma is something that's passed through the DNA. I do think, not that there's, I'm not trying to make essentialisms about, you know, because you've got particular kinds of blood, you are therefore this, but it's speaking to the things that, there are things that remain transmitted. If you even think about African Americans, for example, and there's things that they will do, you know, I think on Twitter, for example, you'll sometimes have memes about things that black parents do. These are people who left the continent years or centuries ago, but there's still something about being from this continent that continues to be transmitted from there. Um, also, at a very practical level, I continue to visit Zimbabwe. So in my household, there was never a question about, particularly as there was a, as um, Zimbabwe became a laughing stock, my parents were always very intent on asserting our Zimbabweanness um, when it was most expedient for people to say, I'm not from the country. They were very clear in saying, well, when we go home, we're not just going to go to you know visit family, but also going to go to the places that we grew up in. We're going to go to the places that um, my father grew up herding cattle, for example. I went to my parents' schools. So a lot of these things, even the stories that I always grew up with them, again, history being created in the mouth, the first place that I got that history was in my parents speaking of their childhood, speaking of their lives, and we've always made a point of going to all of these places. So it was never an, ab Zimbabwe was never an abstract thing. It was something that was there in our household all of the time. And there's a huge Zimbabwe diaspora in the country, I think you would know by now. Um, when I grew up in Durban, for example, there was a huge community of Zimbabwean people. Um, so that I think that's part of why I never actually learned Zulu because a lot of the kids around me were actually just Shona speaking kids. So that culture was there. But I also want to critique this notion that um, 
Zimbabweans who, or people who are outside of a particular place are not of that place because a large part of Zimbabwe's story, at least for the last hundred, well, I mean, it's not even this di notion of being a diaspora is not just post 2000. There have been people who've been moving out of the country in and out and having those movements for a very, very long time and that doesn't make them any less um, Zimbabwean or not. So, I mean, we can have a whole conversation about that, but for me, I think there's no sense for me, a sense of compensation. I will find that even I, compared to other Zimbabweans, I probably am someone who goes kumusha more than many other people do. Kumusha meaning Amarai, Gorai, for example. We have a home there. That's something I go to all the time. So it's never something I had to compensate for in this book. Many people in Zimbabwe would say, oh, wow, I didn't even know this stuff about some of these things. So it's just, this is the stuff that I was interested in, but I never felt that I need to necessarily compensate because I'm comfortable in my positionality as someone who's Southern African before I am even Zimbabwean or South African. Um, so we're going to wrap up now, but when you come and get your book signed, because you're all going to buy a copy of this book, um, <laughs> Panashi will, will answer some questions. Uh, if you have any lingering questions left. We just, from the Chica Natives, want to say a big thank you to everybody who came on a Friday evening in yes. this bitter cold <laughs> um, to come and just add, you know, to the canon of, of black literature that exists. And it's very important. I think part of the work that we do at the Chica Natives is the archiving of black stories. And the story came at, this book came at such an important time, you know. Uh, I think that there are voices that we often don't give credence to, and it was important to have this book exist. So thank you for writing such an important book. Um, I think often we don't realize in the moment how important work is until much later on. And I think that this book is one of those books that's just so important. Um, and at the Cheeky Natives, we have a very interesting rating system. So we don't give <laughs> authors stars and popcorn. I mean, no. Oh, books, how many you know? hectares? How many hectares of land? I think I'm oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, you see, so, so we yeah, know Panache listens yeah, to the Cheeky Natives. Reasons. So we give land to our authors. <laughs> Based on how much we've enjoyed your book, whether we think it was an important text, you know, <laughs> we rate it. It's, it's quite intense. Can I tell you how the settlers <laughs> used to give themselves land in Zimbabwe? How? They would say, you're going to get onto this horse and you're going to keep going until the horse falls down. Literally, that's how in the area that my grandmother was displaced, that's how they decided to demarcate <laughs> land. Like a single person, according to how far this horse can continue moving. That's how they gave land. I'm just going to like... We don't have here. horses at the chimney. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're not there yet. We're okay. not there yet. Um, <laughs> you can go to the studio. We have horses. Like, we have histories of equestrianism. We don't put okay. 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 horses yet. <laughs> okay. For our land. When we get our land, we'll, we'll have horses. Um, yeah. but, but what we do is we, we look at the book and we look at important... Places that have been covered in the book and I this in front of me. This is weird. No, no. Give land. <laughs> How will you know what land you are you going to be like? Are you going to say, okay, we're going to give you a backyard? You know, like, like <laughs> Panache, at this rate, you're not going to give okay. me any land. <laughs> <laughs> so after much discussion, there's a there's a there's a province in in South Africa that. You know, it's very close to your heart. You've grown up in oh, this province. Oh, I love the province. Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Panache notes that she grew up in Limpopo. You know, she has close ties to Limpopo. And so, after much discussion at the Cheeky Natives <laughs> Land Committee that is headed up by myself and the yeah. Chokonolo, very rigorous conversation yes. and debate, we've decided that we're going to give you a piece of land in Mahuba's Kluf. Oh, yes. We need to reclaim that. Yes. <laughs> yes. We're here for that. We're here for you. So, uh, and we just think that you will go and you can relax and, and write in peace and solitude mm -hmm. in, in Mahuba Sloof with the waterfall behind you. Uh, You've been there? Yes, I have. Oh, okay, good. You we, should. We go and be scouts. I mean, how is the land community going to work? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but I think that just speaks to the, the power of the work that you do. I think a lot of people might not know um, what you do outside of the books that you've written and the important work that you've done with Abantu Book Festival, mm -hmm. you know, which which is the first black yes. fest and literary mm -hmm. festival in the country, yes. you know, mm -hmm. and of that scale and of that magnitude. And it's and it's important to have spaces that, that we own and we step into fully, and particularly for our writing and for our books, because mm -hmm. we need to create a canon that exists, right? So that your children don't first encounter people who look and sound like them when they're 20 and they're in varsity and they're reading for their own leisure. You know, mm -hmm. there's something so powerful about seeing yourself represented in, in literature. 
and I think that's part of the important work that you do. Yeah. So from the Cheeky Natives, we are going to gift you Mahubas Kluf when the land comes. <laughs> Call us and get your yeah. title deed. deed. We've got you. <laughs> <laughs> I still think the uh, land should be owned by the state. We can have a whole other discussion <laughs> about You can donate your land to the state. We're happy for you okay. to do that at the Cheeky Natives. It's a that counts. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I think also just to reverberate what Alma is saying, like this is really an important text, both for understanding the history of Zimbabwe, but understanding the history of black women in Southern Africa. So um, from the Cheeky Natives, we are really grateful uh, that you took this time to, one, write this intense book, uh, do the rigorous uh, work that you've done on this book, but also for this, for coming out on a Friday night. And we also want to, you know, celebrate you. Uh, what many people don't know is that you'll be off, jetting off to Boston, Massachusetts yes. to uh, embark on a PhD program at Harvard University. Yes. Um, so this is in celebration of that too, to say, you know what, all the best for this next journey. We have absolutely no doubt as the Cheeky Natives that maybe 10 books are coming out of this PhD project <laughs> and we'll be flying to Boston to do recording. Yes, come and fly <laughs> <with> me, please. <laughs> so thank you everyone for joining us on this episode of the Cheeky Natives. As you've heard, the name of the book is These Bones Will Rise Again, um, authored by the infallible. Um, oh no, I'm not infallible. I'm a woman, I'm a person. <laughs> <laughs> the, Prodigious Panyashi, right? Yes. And also, please, people, don't DM the author for books yes. and be like, you could buy PDF and no, no, no. <laughs> Go to a bookstore, <laughs> buy the books. And also, just shout out to Bridge Books for continuously giving us mm. the space to uh, record our podcast. And if you come to Bridge Books and buy the book, you can get a 10% discount. Okay. Just use the code Cheeky. So, so thank you, everyone. There's no reason to ask for PDF. We're giving you a discount. <laughs> <laughs> don't let the devil use you, please. Yes. <laughs> Until next time, thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much.